Hi, right, it's Mark, and welcome back to my series investigating the ARM Cortex M33 core. And this week we're looking in some detail at the Trust Zone security extension for ARM V8M. We're going to dive into the Hello World example projects for Trust Zone and look at some detailed analysis of how these operate. But first, let's look at the Trust Zone extension and what it means for the Cortex M33 core. With the Cortex-M3 and Cortex-M4, we're already familiar with the processor modes. These are the thread mode and the handler mode. Thread mode is used to execute application software, where handler mode is used to handle exceptions. And any time when our code is running in thread mode, that the core takes an exception or an interrupt, it'll transition into the handler mode. In addition, there are privilege levels on the Cortex M3 and M4 architectures. These are unprivileged and privileged. In the unprivileged mode, the software has limited access to the MSR and MRS instructions and also cannot use the CPS change processor state instruction. When the core is operating in the privileged mode, it has access to the system timer, the nested vectored interrupt controller, and the system control block. For example, FreeRTOS will operate in handler mode when the kernel is running and uses the features of the Cortex M3 or M4 architecture to transition between modes and privilege levels. With the introduction of the ARM V8M architecture with the Trust Zone security extension, there are new states introduced. These are the non-secure state and the secure state. With the introduction of the secure and non-secure states, there are new SysTick timers. So there are two SysTick timers, one for the secure state and one for the non-secure state. And the main and the process stack pointers have been extended so there are now four stack pointers. With the introduction of the new states, we're able to isolate different resources on chip so we can have different domains of operation, a secure domain and a non-secure domain. So for example, interrupts can be directed from the interrupt controller to secure code or to non-secure code depending on the significance of the a very important concept is that the security state of the chip is defined by the memory address that the core is accessing. In this diagram, I show the CPU operating in the secure state. The memory has been partitioned into secure green and non-secure red memory blocks. And the core can only access instructions and execute from secure program flash. When the M33 core is operating in the secure state, it can access data RAM variables, for example, in secure areas of data RAM and also in non-secure memory. In this diagram, we have the core operating in the non-secure state. In this example, the CPU can only execute code from the non-secure program memory, and it can only access data, reading and writings of variables, from the non-secure data memory. On the LPC 55S69, the memory map has been split into secure and non-secure green and red memory blocks. And you can see that all of the major memory regions for the Cortex architecture have been split into non-secure and secure. We can see that if address bit 28 is zero, the memory is non-secure. And if address bit 28 is one, then the memory is secure. There's another level of detail which I'll show you next week because in this diagram we can see that the program flash memory is all showing as non-secure but we have a method to make it secure or non-secure as our application requires. Let's begin as always by importing one of the example SDK projects. I select the development board which I'm using and this time I'm going to select a trust zone example and it's the Hello World example. Note that there are two Hello World examples. Hello World underscore NS, non-secure, and Hello World underscore S, the secure project. If I select either one, both get selected for import. Let's import it into the IDE workspace. 
Both projects are now imported into my workspace. We can see hello world s secure and hello world underscore ns non-secure. The two projects are going to run in completely separate memory areas. Let's look and see how that's configured. So I'll select the secure project and I'll use the trusted execution environment settings to look at the memory for the projects. Here's the trusted execution environment settings and down at the bottom of memory, we can see areas of flash that have been configured. Down at address zero, we see flash memory in the device. The secure project is going to run from base address 10 million. And this is an area that's been configured to be secure. We'll see how that's done next week. The non-secure project is going to be running from base address 10,000. And we can see that this is a non-secure area of memory. The configuration of the memory areas is the responsibility for the secure project. And we can see, as well as some areas of flash, the um, stack areas have been configured and the RAM for all of the projects. Okay, let's go back into the C, C++ settings and look at the code. The C source module for the secure project is in hello world underscore S and that's here. It's just like any other project for MCU Expresso where we get to main, the chip is initialized and then the main project begins. One difference from a conventional project is that quite early on in the code execution, this function here, board init trust zone is called. And it's important that that's called as early as possible in code execution. This function has been called from a low level function called system init quite soon after startup. Once the board is configured and we print F the hello world message, we next set about setting up the non-secure project. If you remember, the non-secure project is based from address 10,000. So we see that here, the macro expansion for non-secure start, the start address for the non-secure project is 10,000. The secure project has responsibility for setting up the non-secure main stack pointer, for setting up the vector table, for setting up the reset vector, and finally for calling the non-secure code. At this line 79, code execution is gonna transition from the secure project to the non-secure project. Let's look at the non-secure project now. The non-secure project also has a main source, and that's in hello world non-secure. Of course, the board is all up and running when this program begins. So the main function now doesn't need to do any low level config and just sets about running the main application. In this case, it prints some messages, makes a string compare and then spins in this while loop. But importantly, the functions that it calls are defined in the secure project. So this example shows a function call from the non-secure project into the secure project. And we can see that by looking at the definition for this print non-secure entry. It's redirected through this hash defined to debug console printf non-secure entry. And this project then calls the veneer table in the secure project for that function. It's quite important to see what subtle behavior went on just there. I was in the hello world non-secure and I looked for the definition of printf non-secure entry, which is debug console printf non-secure entry. And that's in the veneer table. But the veneer table is actually in the secure project. And normally we wouldn't have access to the source code for the secure project. The way the two projects are linked is through a header file, which the Hello World non-secure project has. It's called veneer table.h. And whilst we have it open, let's notice that this function, which is exported by the secure project to the non-secure project, has this decoration. Uh, it's the attribute Cortex microcontroller security extension 
non-secure entry. This is a decoration for the function which forces the function to be exported into an object file that's provided to the non-secure project at compile time. Well, with compiling, let's do that right now. So I'm going to select, first of all, the secure project and build that. Part of the build process will be this function is going to be exported into an object file for the non-secure project. We can see that in the output folder. The output that is generated is project name underscore cmse underscore lib dot o. It's an alpha output file that can be used by the, by the non-secure project. Turning now to the non-secure project, I can build this. And this is going to use the veneer table dot h header file and the object file we just looked at to compile the code. Lastly, to execute our code, I select the secure project and I'm going to run a debug session. As always, there's a probe discovery. We find the LPC link to Simpsys DAP compliant probe built into the EVK that we're using. And once again, there's another probe discovery because we're now loading two distinct projects. As always, we load to the core zero. Here's the second project being loaded. And here we are at the first line of main in the secure project, hello world underscore s. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to the non-secure project and I'm going to put a breakpoint at the first printf in that main module and then resume my project, f8 resume. The secure project is run and printf and now the code is stopped in the hello world non-secure project on the first line where we're going to printf non-secure entry with the message. Remember that this is going to call a function in the secure world. Let me step over that. We can see in the console window the, the printf message is coming out. And on line 41, we're going to do a string compare. Again, that's exported from the secure project to the non-secure project. So we're actually jumping into secure memory and with this function call. And I'm going to resume with F8. We can see that the string compare has failed because the two strings are actually different. Both strings are not equal. So there we are, our first trust zone project with a secure and a non-secure implementation with the non-secure project calling functions exported from the secure project. And next week, we're going to do a very detailed analysis of what's going on here. As always, let me stop my debugger, return to the edit window and close my two projects. Did you find this helpful? Leave a comment below. And if you enjoy these videos, please subscribe to my channel, like this video and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching and see you next time.